Hello, Internet. We are live. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 22 of the Stanford MLC Seminar Series. I'm Kron. We have with us today, as always, Dan, Piero, Theodore, and our guest today, Jason Knight from OctoML. Um, as always, we're going to be uh, introducing Jason first. He's going to give a 30-minute talk followed by a 30-minute plus podcast style discussion where you, the live audience, can ask questions and chat. Uh, we'll be monitoring that chat throughout, so feel free to drop in questions as Jason is talking. Uh, a little bit about the talk, so we're going to be chatting today about the foundations of the ML software stack, compilers with Jason. And um, Jason is the co-founder and CPO at OctoML, building a machine learning acceleration platform for deploying machine learning anywhere uh, across hardware, uh, different hardware types. Um, and before starting OctoML, he also was at Intel AI um, and got his PhD in machine learning and comp bio, so uh, quite a journey there. Um, and today he's gonna be talking about reshaping the ML software bedrock with compilers. Um, Jason, if you're ready, take it away. Great, thanks so much, Karen. Uh, great to be here. And yeah, as, as Karen mentioned, I'm going to uh, kind of give you a little bit of a chronological journey of, of how I landed in the, uh, the bowels of the machine learning infrastructure space and how that led to OctoML and some of the journeys uh, that I'm going to describe. So uh, rewinding the clock back to 2016, I uh, had come off doing some computational biology stuff that I'd uh, love to you know, uh, chat about if, if anyone's interested in discussion. And I joined a machine learning accelerator startup called uh, Nirvana in 2016. And they were producing one of the first uh, ASIC uh, dedicated hardware accelerators for deep learning, uh, founded in 2014. I joined shortly before the acquisition by Intel in 2016. And um, as, as part of their, their effort on the hardware side, they were also doing contract work and, and building their own framework, uh, deep learning for training framework called NEON. And NEON at the time was one of the fastest, or if not the fastest deep learning training uh, framework uh, much faster than CAFE and, and TensorFlow and, and, and then PyTorch when it came out later in 2016. And one of the reasons it was fast was, uh, I, I have this link on the right, uh, MaxAss is, is uh, actually a reverse engineered uh, PTX to SAS NVIDIA assembly uh, compiler that was written by uh, an amazing engineer, Scott Gray, who's now at OpenAI. And uh, this enabled us to write uh, even faster convolution and gem kernels uh, than what was available from, from NVIDIA at the time and QDNN. And so Neon was, was uh, really kind of ahead of its, its time in terms of the speed uh, capable. Um, the problem was is that you know, because these kernels were, were written in the way they were and then Neon was written in a pretty traditional imperative operator execution model, which means it essentially walks over the computational graph and executes and invokes each kernel uh, sequentially. Uh, at the time, because we were looking forward to the development and, and unveiling of our, of our hardware uh, with, with a, a much larger amount of performance than was available on GPUs at the time, uh, the importance of kind of ringing out the last mile of performance in terms of uh, these kind of arm dolls like uh, slowdowns if you don't get layout and memory reuse and all of these other considerations uh, nailed, which I'll, I'll get into in a second. And then also uh, the, the hardware we work on had less hardware scheduling capabilities than what's available in common GPUs with uh, warp hardware schedulers that uh, you know are, are common in NVIDIA and AMD GPUs uh, today and, and back then. And so for, for these and uh, multiple reasons, we uh, needed to kind of rethink what we were doing in Neon. And as an example of, of one of these concrete problems, is something called layout optimization. So I have here, uh, and actually this is a, a slide out of, uh, I think one of Matthias' uh, classes um, that you can find in the bottom. But here on the left, you have essentially a linear computational graph of a deep learning uh, execution uh, pipeline. And, and uh, convolution, if, if you're not familiar with, with that operation, uh, is, is typically implemented in different ways, depending on the layout of the tensor in memory. And, and what I mean by layout is uh, when you actually take a multi-dimensional tensor and you, you know, linearize that into a region of memory, then um, you know, there are multiple choices in terms of which axes, uh, which dimensions you lay out in first, second, third, and fourth. And this is, uh, this is the layout here. You see NCHW uh, for batch channel height and width for these two-dimensional two images. 
And in this graph, uh, every operator has a uh, choice of layout. And so convolution can be done in either NCHW or NHWC layouts. Uh, actually, there's, there's many others as well. And so uh, if, if you have different selections uh, for different operators, you need to introduce these yellow nodes, which are uh, layout uh, reorderings. And so this is basically just read the memory off of uh, either DRAM or uh, high bandwidth memory, uh, you know, essentially just permute its dimensions and then write it back out to memory, or, or you can sometimes fuse it directly. Um, and so the optimization here is, well, this wastes time and energy. And so can you optimize the graph to minimize the set of these uh, layout transformations while maximizing the performance and, and minimizing the end-to-end -end latency? Um, because each of these implementations of the operator on different layouts for particular hardware has different uh, parameters, uh, performance characteristics. And so it's a pretty gnarly, uh, fun combinatorial optimization problem. Uh, and this is just one, one of the things that uh, is, is, is a problem when you're essentially walking over the graph, you know, executing kernels one by one uh, that are handed to you from like a Python runtime. And so at the time we, we came up with something called ngGraph, which was a, uh, a high level intermediate representation for um, these computational graphs and, and a set of optimization passes and, and code generation that enabled uh, you to, to consider these computational graphs all in one time do all these optimizations in a series of passes, just like a, a standard compiler, but at a higher level of, of uh, representation at the tensor level compute instead of scalar level compute like you would find in GCC and LLVM and do all these types of optimizations. Another benefit that came out of this is that as the Intel uh, acquisition uh, continued and, and we you know, spread our tendrils through uh, Intel uh, as, as an acquisition sometimes does, then we, we realized that, well, another really big benefit of this approach is, you know, Intel uh, being a big company has multiple hardware backends here on the left and has to support, uh, you know, customers and, and all of the frameworks that they want to use on the, the upper side here. And you have this combinatorial uh, M times N level of engineering effort to support all this. Whereas if you introduce an abstraction layer, then you can reduce this down to something more like M plus N engineering effort and reuse a lot of the intermediate uh, capabilities. Pretty standard compiler benefits, but, but playing themselves out at uh, an Intel scale uh, and actually even larger scale uh, solution. And so we, we did that for a few years um, and uh, <clears throat> eventually NGRAPH landed in, in a merger with uh, the OpenVINO project that uh, Intel still runs today. Uh, it's, it's, so you can check that out if you're interested. And it's, it's also still open source. And I just wanted to mention that over this same time period, we also saw uh, that this was this problem. We were not alone in having this uh, from Google. We saw uh, shortly after we started the NGraph project, XLA came out uh, uh, essentially to solve some of the pro same problems with the TPU stack that they were uh, rolling out at the time. Grappler is a, is a component inside of TensorFlow that does similar things. Onyx runtime from Microsoft and uh, from Facebook and the PyTorch community, we, Torch Script and the GLOW project separately. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, came about though, is as we worked with NGRAPH and, and saw these other solutions in the, the field is that they all had uh, the same key problem though, which is that, and, and there's two big manifestations of this is since they're um, uh, essentially just leveraging these handwritten kernel libraries and still executing on top of them, uh, the, they still suffer from uh, custom operator support. So if, if I'm a TensorFlow user uh, or, or PyTorch and I want to write a low level, uh, you know, high performance kernel on a, a, a loop nest and scalar wise level, and, and I can't compose this out of the existing TensorFlow and PyTorch operators, then I am kind of stuck because maybe I can write this in a, you know, directly in CUDA or low level device specific um, way. Uh, or, or in C++ for, for a CPU, and then register this as a black box to the, the compiler. But uh, then the compiler isn't able to understand the semantics of the, this operator and, and do its typical optimizations. And so um, similarly from kind of the, the backend uh, hardware provider's perspective, you know, we had to support all of these operators across all of these hardware backends. And so that M plus N advantage, you know, the, 
it's still pretty expensive in terms of you know, supporting all these operators in the same way and, and optimizing them across all these targets. And, and, and then, yeah, if, if, if we have users want to write custom operators, then we're kind of sunk. Uh, so fortunately, oh, in the 2017 and 2018 timeframe, we saw the rise of, of compilers that not only handled the high level optimizations, but uh, focused also on the code generation aspect. Uh, and so I'm going to you know, walk through two of these uh, here today, TVM and uh, something called Isomapper. Um, but I'll, I'll mention that PlatML uh, was, was an early one here as well from a startup called Vertex AI that was acquired by Intel. And uh, MLIR is, is, is another approach from Google uh, that's now kind of merging with XLA. And, and I can talk about that more in Q&A, but I don't have as much time to, to go through that. And of course, there's a, a, a lot of deep literature here and adjacent and academic uh, efforts that I don't have time to get into. But I wanted to touch on uh, you know, a, a project that we developed as a summer internship project at Intel. Uh, this was work with by Matthew Sotida there on the left. And you're fortunate enough, uh, those of you at Stanford to be, uh, you know, Matthew is actually joining the Stanford uh, PhD class in the fall, I believe. And uh, you're lucky to have him because uh, as a undergraduate intern for a summer project, uh, he did all of this essentially by himself and uh, as, I'll, as I'll describe. Uh, so the idea here was for one of our tensor level uh, accelerators, uh, machine learning accelerator chips, uh, we had these two dimensional tensor um, intrinsics or, or ISA instructions. And so it, we weren't really sure how um, co low level code generation could automatically go from a high level description of an operator to matching these relatively chunky ISA uh, intrinsics at the hardware level. And so Matthew took this project on and, and, and wrote this uh, prototype compiler, which could take uh, kind of arbitrary loop nest programs on, on the left. And by lowering this to a, a, a formal format and then applying uh, a set of uh, reasoned about uh, transformations and then doing uh, graph isomorphic transformations and mappings to a deterministic set of, of operators was then able to um, essentially uh, do this, which, which is a set of performance benchmarks on the actual hardware that we had at the time. And uh, the, so the, the, the blue is, is uh, the number of cycles that um, for a given workload uh, on this, this accelerator hardware. And orange is the, the same uh, in, in um, computation, but uh, done by the kernel library that was generated by uh, the, the team at the time at Intel of, of professional engineers writing uh, these, these low level operators uh, somewhat manually and, and tuning them by hand. And so as you can see on the left here, this is a gem uh, matrix multiplication. And uh, for workloads, which the, the kernel team had operated then uh, you can see that that Matthew's prototype compiler was nowhere near as good, uh, which which is sensible and makes sense. But as you look at still interesting workload uh, parameters, these are gem matrix sizes M and K. Um, you can see that you know as you go kind of off the beaten path, but still interesting sizes that are interesting for deep learning workloads, then uh, you can actually get a reasonable amount of performance and even improvements over handwritten kernels uh, generated by uh, very talented teams of engineers. And then on, on the right here, a slightly more sophisticated workload, a full GRU kernel with a, a mixture of, of matrix multiplication and element-wise operators. Uh, you can see that uh, the, uh, Matthew's code is actually able to leverage some of the, the kind of flexibility of a, a code-generated uh, approach, uh, as opposed to the kind of uh, more rigid approach from kernel libraries to actually get pretty significant speed ups. Uh, and again, this is you know, one undergraduate intern uh, and it was just a prototype, but it still, it, it really opened my eyes to, to the approach here. And so as a result of that, we, you know, we and, and, and myself, I, I started to look more at this space and really found uh, TVM as, as a project that I'm going to talk to you about kind of for the rest of the talk. And actually in that same paper, we did a, a, a slight evaluation of TVM that showed us that while TVM uh, and some of its early capabilities was, you know, ha had relatively low performance, uh, with a few small modifications of applying kind of uh, uh, a kernel matching approach, which we call ISAM TVM here, which you know takes a, 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 a micro code, highly optimized 
um, a bit of assembly, but then stitches that and, and compiles that in a set of for loops for, for wider workloads, you can get uh, essentially most of the performance back uh, and, and uh, approaching the region of, of a very highly optimized hand tuned library like libxsmm on a, a Intel CPU here. And so that, uh, that's what led me to you know, getting involved with and becoming more invested in the TVM ecosystem. So I wanna take a step forward now to today and, and talk a little bit about TVM, what it is and, and why you might care about it. And so TVM is an open source machine learning optimization compiler and runtime uh, framework. And uh, it has a two level intermediate representation, Relay and, and Tensor IR. Uh, and I'll, I'll describe this a little bit later on. And then it has essentially a set of code generation backends for most of the hardware you'd be interested in generating uh, code on today for machine learning workloads. And I'll explain, um, I'll, I'll dig into all these components uh, in the following slides. But the, the key point here is that uh, TVM actually kind of doubles down on, on the philosophy of automation by applying machine learning itself to the process of machine learning compilation through something called auto TVM and auto scheduling. And I'll, I'll explain how that works in a bit. But that's essentially the core um, innovation that allows for what traditionally has been an intractable problem is how do you automate the, the generation of code that approaches uh, human level performance. And, and just a you know, quick marketing slide is, is that you know, TVM is no longer a research project. It's, it's a full industry standard stack and is in use in production by you know, many of the large tech companies. And uh, feel free to check out video recordings from, from many of these companies that at our last conference we ran in December. So just uh, plugging that there. And I, I wanted to take a step back because one of the cool things about a project like TVM is, is that because of the flexibility that code generation uh, gives you, then it, it, it kind of manifests in multiple different ways. And so I wanted to unpack those a little bit. So one of them is, is like we talked about the end-to-end -end deep learning model optimization. And so you know, just how do I make my model run as fast as possible? And for this, of course, TVM has the importers from all the common frameworks today and, and serialization formats. And uh, we, you know, I, if I have time, I can show a few benchmark slides showing kind of the, the capability of, of um, performance improvements we've seen over the past uh, year or so. Uh, another uh, example of flexibility here is, well, what if I want to run classical machine learning models and get acceleration and platform portability there as well? And actually, this is um, was great work we saw from uh, a team at Microsoft uh, developed this project called Hummingbird and essentially took uh, you know, what you would not consider dense linear algebra operations like uh, random forests and gradient boosted trees and uh, uh, on, a, on a, a, a lark essentially tried to compile these down to dense uh, operations and, and sparse operations anyway and leverage something like TVM and then essentially saw pretty significant performance improvements both on CPU and GPU and also a, a breadth of, of capabilities in that uh, you, know, you can find some libraries like XGBoost have GPU acceleration, but others like scikit-learn, you know, it's more of a mixed bag. And so, um, but with TVM, you, you have the full flexibility of a compiler to, to target uh, a wide swath of, of hardware types. Another uh, thing you might need is, uh, well, you know, gosh, as a hardware vendor, I've already put a huge amount of effort in, in, in an existing operator library um, and, and teams to build and, and maintain that. Uh, do I just have to throw all that away and, and trust that uh, your machine learning based compiler is going to generate better code all of the time? And, and so this is why TVM, um, uh, one of the design principles from the beginning was, was a very pragmatic approach to like, uh, as opposed to a ideological based, you know, compilers or, or will defeat everything uh, kind of, uh, extreme approach. And so TVM can actually assess uh, the performance of, of a workload uh, using existing libraries and its code generation uh, capabilities, and then pick the best uh, performance of the two, or, and actually interleave calls to code generation and uh, existing libraries. Also, what this enables is for hardware that uh, doesn't yet have APIs that are targetable by code generation approaches, then um, it, it offers a seamless path to supporting those uh, hardware types as well through um, existing operator libraries. And, and so, you know, ARM ethos uh, NPU is actually using a combination of both approaches and ARM uses a blend of these approaches across uh, CPU, GPU, and NPU support. 
Uh, Amazon Inferentia is an example of this as well. And this enables you to leverage uh, existing libraries, like I mentioned. Uh, so you get a, a, we call this the best of both worlds approach. Another uh, use case is from a hardware or, or maybe a hardware researcher or hardware vendor use case. Uh, I want to be able to quickly rev or, or iterate on, on silicon designs and, and test those with workloads and get performance estimations out. And so TVM has a bring your own RTL capability, which allows you to plug up and, and pretty easily test out designs. And we have examples of, of this uh, if with, with FPGA RTL up on, online. And then finally, and, and actually maybe uh, coming back to my earlier point, uh, maybe perhaps the more important point is, is uh, for, for those who want to be able to write custom kernels and, and do research at the either at the forefront of, of machine learning algorithm design or, or tweaking existing kernels to tweak out uh, the, the maximum performance or capabilities or expand uh, into you know, sparse operators, et cetera. And TVM enables you to have kind of three flavors of, of custom kernels. One is, is I, I essentially want full control, but I'm, I'm, uh, I still want some of the portability and, and uh, TVM supports this as uh, writing uh, essentially tensor IR uh, directly where you still get uh, a lot of the flexibility of, of the code generation backends. Uh, auto tuning is is a slightly higher level representation where you you say you know what I'm going to describe the sketch of the algorithm and then leave some of the parameters up for uh, the TVM to tune and, and figure out automatically the best values and then fully automatic scheduling is all described later um, and we've used these uh, and we in the community have used these for uh, great success on a number of applications uh, like sparse uh, execution of transformers and getting uh, two to three X end-to-end -end speed ups on CPUs and GPUs on uh, Hugging Faces Prunebert. And we've also used this to leverage, um, you know, and, and do end-to-end -end single bit neural network compilation and, and getting uh, quite large speed ups there. Because there, and there the, the trick is, you know, you, it's not just the comms and, and jams that you need to accelerate, but, but you need to fuse uh, all of the element wise. Otherwise you suffer really bad um, dolls like slowdowns uh, as well. And so um, just to quickly highlight uh, Relay, as I mentioned, is this kind of higher level capability of TVM and enables uh, the, the, the higher level optimizations and fusion uh, and device placement, et cetera. And then a, a lower level tensor IR is this loop nest uh, scalar wise uh, optimization intermediate representation where you can apply uh, some of these uh, pattern matching and, and stuff that we talked about in Isomapper, for instance. And just to give you a flavor of what this looks like in code, uh, you have the, um, here's a little code snippet where you declare your inputs. And uh, essentially this is uh, the tensor expression is the uh, kind of most simplistic, but, but quite uh, powerful still way of, of uh, writing uh, computation. So here we have a N by N matrix. And we're saying for each um, IJ uh, scalar in that matrix, then define the output as as an element-wise sum um, here, or actually as a matrix-wise reduction across the uh, k-axis here. Oh, sorry, this is element-wise, so it's it's just an element-wise uh, uh, computation. And then um, here's where you create a scheduler and, and uh, a schedule, and, and this is where you have the option of potentially either um, expressing more of the the sketch or, or even the full sketch of the program and, and getting the low-level details or leaving it. Uh, at a high level for TVM to figure out. And then this would uh, print the resulting uh, TIR code, essentially one level above the, the kind of generated code out uh, for whatever backend you're using. And uh, just to give you a flavor of what's happening under the hood, uh, auto scheduling is, is uh, something that uh, was pushed out uh, mid last year. And uh, what this enables, is, as, I, as I kind of alluded to earlier, is, is that you have the ability to uh, write this high-level mathematical description in, in TE like I, I just showed you. And then TVM can uh, naively expand this to a corresponding uh, program, which probably has terrible performance if you co-generate that directly. Um, but this is where uh, TVM has a set of, of rules encoded for uh, a given hardware class. And, and this is kind of a, a, a set of heuristics for here are all the different ways that you can possibly uh, kind of expand a loop nest into two loop nests for multi-level tiling or uh, do some kind of caching 
uh, if the hardware supports that, or uh, a number of others. And, and so with a fairly modest number of rules, I think it's on the order of you know, 10 to 20 for something like uh, uh, most GPU uh, applications and capabilities, then now your, your algorithm, uh, TVM can generate uh, essentially enumerate uh, possibilities of, of, of expanding the naive program into a potential optimized program with a set of unspecified uh, parameters here in terms of the tile factoring size or prefetching size. And then TVM can then take that and sample one more layer and actually instantiate that with a, a set of specific uh, you know, numbers for, for those uh, gaps that the sketch left. And, um, and, and this enables uh, us to generate efficient kernels with only a single compute description. The problem is how do you find which program is, is, is the best given the huge search base that you've just enumerated here. And this is where the machine learning that I mentioned comes in is essentially by um, having a way of extracting uh, statistical features out of the uh, syntax tree uh, that, that uh, out of those sketches that are produced uh, we can then set up a uh, kind of hardware in the loop um, online uh, learning and, and, and exploration process where TVM will um, you know, select a, a given expression out of the search space, generate that code, run it on the device, and then use that to learn an online cost model that it will then use to guide uh, which expressions uh, or which instantiations are explored in the or, uh, following uh, iterations of that loop. As you can see on this, um, you know, one uh, Conv2D example down here, uh, where we have CUDN as a, a baseline, then uh, over on, on the order of 100 to 200 trials, we're getting better performance than CUDN. And uh, and and one reason for this is you say, wait a second, you know, CUDN is a highly optimized library written by engineers uh, who know the hardware. How can a dumb algorithm, you know, potentially find that? And one of the capabilities is while Machine learning is helping by pruning the search space and guiding uh, the, the uh, unfolding of all these possible um, sketch rules. Uh, another benefit is we can do specialization. So um, because we can generate a, a kernel custom for every set of parameter sizes for that model, then it allows us to, to really fine tune the algorithm. Whereas a, a kernel engineer has to write schedules uh, and kernels that write work over a, a broad swath of algorithm space. And so specialization and, and machine learning guided is, is kind of the two uh, main weapons at our disposal. And another thing to mention here is that uh, in red, I have this transferred model here, is, is that um, because this cost model describes how the hardware you know, reacts in certain scenarios and, and uh, different prefetching um, strategies, et cetera, then we can actually take uh, these models learned on given operators and hardware types and transfer them across operators and hardware. So it, it allows us to borrow strength across uh, the space here. And so the, uh, all of this essentially led us to the creation of OctoML, the, the company we kicked off about two years ago. And it's essentially to take our learnings of, of you know, TVM and what that enables sophisticated engineers to do and to, to bring this uh, capability more uh, to, to more engineers and more developers and uh, to, to give, you know, higher performance machine learning models uh, in the cloud and the edge, and especially the edge, because the set of software stacks there are typically, um, you know, uh, weaker than, than what you see in, in cloud. And that's mainly because of NVIDIA and, and uh, Intel's efforts over the last many, many years. And also, as, as you see more research advancements coming down the pipe, like sparsity, quantization, matrix factorization, you know, sparse gating, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, it, it becomes more and more clear that uh, the, the permutation of number of operators and hardwares continues to grow. So uh, by leveraging a compiler approach, we can uh, kind of enable more people to benefit from these capabilities. And so we're building a SaaS model optimization platform here at the bottom that we call the optimizer. And that enables anyone to upload a model. And then we handle all the details of doing this hardware in the loop optimization process and showing you the benchmark results and, uh, and then in enabling you to package it really easily for the downstream hardware that you're interested in. And of course, we're working, we're continuing to push the TVM ecosystem as well with, with uh, many partners. And I just wanted to you know, end here with uh, two performance slides and, and kind of ongoing challenges slide. 
so one of the cool things we've seen is quantitatively, um, you know, we, we've we've always uh, suspected this was the case, and it was great to see it come out in the data. Is that um, over the past you know, year or so, we've done a number of uh, uh, performance studies with with uh, partners and uh, using a combination of private and public models. And uh, one of the cool things we've seen is that uh, while TVM on, in general is performs more than two x performance improvement. Uh, over the best baseline for a given hardware model pair, uh, each one of these lines here being a, a single experiment model hardware pair. Uh, what we've seen is that actually, if you segment out private versus public, then we actually see a better uh, average performance on, on private models than on public models. And we suspect this is because, uh, you know, the companies like NVIDIA and Intel are only able to optimize the public models that are available. Uh, and, and whereas TVM and automated approaches like it uh, optimize the same across all models. And so here you're kind of seeing a quantitative uh, you know, measurement of, of how the, the handwritten, hand-optimized kernel libraries kind of holds back people when they try to go off the, the beaten path of the core models that are commonly benchmarked and optimized for. And then also just to call out that, uh, you know, again, one of the benefits of TVM is you you have a huge range of, of capabilities and in, in, in terms of hardware supported. And here's you know, ARM A class, NVIDIA G, you know, consumer and server class, and even a MIPS uh, CPU camera based platform. Uh, all the, and, and then on the model side, you know, computer vision and random forest, et cetera. And I just wanted to end here with uh, you know, two ongoing challenges is, is the space is really interesting. And it, it, we've, we, we've uh, come a long way with uh, auto scheduling, as I mentioned, but there's still a lot left to be done. It's a, a, really, a lot of really cool uh, optimization problems here. Uh, for example, if you look at the low level code generation that I described in the, the optimization process there, there's a, uh, an interesting coupling there with that and the high level optimizations, uh, because in the high level, you wanna, uh, deter you wanna do you know, fusion of operators, uh, device placement, uh, et cetera, and, and, and concern yourself with, well, maybe there's an, another ongoing thread, maybe a rendering thread on the side is also using this GPU. So how do I kind of generate code that's either defensible against um, other threads running at the same time, or maybe two copies of the code, one that assumes a, a low utilization, a, a mixed utilization workload, uh, and then also kind of uh, doing this high level and low level optimization simultaneously based on feedback as you go. Uh, with the low-level procedure as you're tuning. Uh, so there's there's a bunch of uh, interesting kind of coupled optimization problems there. And then uh, even further out is uh, there's kind of an HCI or, or maybe CCI, if you want to call it that, uh, problem here in terms of uh, ISAs is, is usually defined by hardware uh, targets are essentially um, designed for humans, right? Or designed by humans, essentially for humans. But now in this realm of where you assume or, or have the capability of, of a system automatically generating code, then what is the best ISA or, or kind of hardware software interface that uh, embraces this uh, paradigm and, and world? And I think we've uh, only just begun to kind of scratch the surface of what that looks like. So uh, for, for those of you on the uh, you know, hardware side, or uh, that's, that's a potential interest. Uh, so, so thanks so much for your time. Uh, hopefully that was uh, interesting. Uh, I know it's been a, a wild ride for me uh, as well. So, um, and it continues to be uh, really exciting. So yeah, we're always hiring and we're also specifically looking for uh, academic interests. So if you have models that you're you know, wanting to put into a small footprint device or are needing more performance out, especially in the research uh, world where you're, you're you know, exploring new kernel types, et cetera, then please reach out to us. Let's go straight to my inbox. And uh, otherwise, feel free to follow us or you know, and join in the TVM community. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Jason. Thanks, that was a great talk. Um, I wanna make sure to remind everybody in the audience that um, you can send in your questions in chat and we'll um, try to get those across to Jason. Um, do you mind also stopping a screen sharing? Thank you so much. Yeah, um, Yeah. so I guess to kick us off, maybe um, uh, one of the things that I feel like um, is interesting about compilers is that it's, uh, something that's largely hidden from you know the majority of programmers um, and and by design right like you don't want to have to deal with uh, maybe the complexities of that code 
Um, so do you have any thoughts on, I guess, um, it seems like you're, you're thinking a little bit about how to expose interfaces into this with, with some of the work you're doing at OctoML, but I'm curious if you have thoughts on, um, you know, how this affects maybe how people program or, uh, or you know, like the average machine yeah. learning person uh, should think about, you know, this, this kind of layer underneath their code. Yeah, great question. I think uh, two, two points on that. One is uh, with Jax, and I saw Roy's great talk earlier on, on this. Uh, you, you're starting to see uh, people think, okay, assume I have a compiler. In that case, it's XLA, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, now, what does the right interface look like to describing my machine learning workload? And I, I think, as you saw from Roy's talk, it's, it's a pretty compelling vision um, with the caveat there on XLA of, oh, we don't yet support uh, element-wise loop nests. Um, and so that's one of the things we, we are hoping to bring to the table. And, and we've even um, thought about actually just integrating as a JAX API with TVM. So now, oh, now you're JAX, uh, you, don't, you don't just need VMAP. And VMAP, you can write full loop nests and compile that down. Um, I think the other thing to mention is there has been this really fascinating tension between imperative, uh, you know, PyTorch style, TensorFlow eager, and then the, you know, oh no, give us the full graph so we can optimize it. And I've, I've lived this for multiple years at, at Intel because on the hardware side, you're like, no, please give us the full graph. We need that, right? But otherwise we're, we're really struggling to, to, you know, map your workload to you know, high performance in the back end. And, and you see these interesting blends of, of approaches um, with like TF Eager, for instance, or you know, Torch Script enabling you to you know, do uh, JIT compilation for kind of regions of your, of your graph. And I, I think there's still a lot of, um, actually, I think uh, Zach DeVito had a, a paper recently on kind of taking Python and just like fracturing it and making it multi-process and just shipping that whole bundle to the, the server. So kind of sidestepping the problem altogether. Uh, and I think there's still a lot to be uh, WebAssembly is another potential aspect here of kind of giving you that flexibility and portability and general purpose. And so some combination of, you know, that and, and these compilers, like mixing those and blending those together, I think it's a, a really fertile space, especially when you look at the application code as well. Yeah, great question. Awesome. Hey, Jason, I, I was curious um, what lessons you learned as you took TVM from maybe like the initial research idea to eventually fully deploying it as a full product with uh, many users. Uh, were there kind of different use cases or failure modes or, or things like that that you didn't kind of ex expect as you expanded? Like what, what lessons did you learn um, uh, from like kind of yeah. taking it into production? Yeah, great question. One has been uh, thankfully uh, that we, you know, going in, uh, the assumption is that the compiler approach enables you to quickly, you know, spin up kernel support and uh, especially as we get auto scheduling uh, more and more polished. And so that's been really nice to see is when there have been you know, gaps in uh, either performance or capabilities or both, then our, our ability to turn around from you know, operator not supported to fully supported and faster than anything else is, has been really you know, fast and e great to see. It doesn't mean it's, you know, it's a solved problem as, uh, at all, but, um, and then uh, I guess it's, it's interesting because one lesson learned as well is that we've I've seen both sides of of um, you know talking to users who are essentially doing uh, kind of hyperspectral imaging uh, convnets and and they're being so frustrated that yeah all of the TensorRT and OpenVINO solutions are you know assume three channel images right and and just like there's these blind spots in the kind of open or the the machine learning infrastructure community and so the those are great to see because, well, for us, you know, selfishly, because it, I think it both indicates the future and it's also showcasing, uh, which when we gave them good results, that uh, the compiler approach actually works. Right, right. On the other hand, there's still a large amount of interest on very common bulk models, like, uh, you know, the MLPerf, uh, Resident 50s and BERTs of the world. And so with those, it's, it's, um, it's more challenging because, uh, you know, the, the Intels and NVIDIA's of the world have, have put a lot of resources into maximizing their performance there. And so we still have to keep up there. And, and we're, uh, thankfully we do a good job and we have best of both worlds to kind of catch uh, cases where we're still working on it. But um, it's, it's interesting how you have to span this massive spectrum of 
you know, esoteric workloads uh, that show the future and then, but still the, the very common core workloads where people put a lot of hand engineering effort. Yeah, really cool, really interesting stuff. Thanks. Jason, I have, I think, a question that is a good segue with respect to what we were discussing. And it's, um, again, looking at the, your experience in like um, real world applications from customers, um, I'm curious of um, your perception about where actually are most of the bottlenecks in a whole machine learning pipeline, more than specifically in the uh, single um, tensor computation graph of the um, of a specific model. Because I can imagine that there are like other parts of the pipeline that could become a bottleneck, pre-processing, post-processing, or other data manipulation aspects. And as a consequence, if you are thinking of you know, a way to potentially you know, compile all the pipeline rather than just the model, model piece, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah great question, Piero. I, I agree completely. And, and that was actually what I was alluding to with WebAssembly, um, because I think right now it's still pretty... I mean, I remember talking to um, uh, engineers at, at Google many years ago and their frustration of just, okay, I've got my model working in TensorFlow and Python, and now I have to ship it to a, a mobile phone and I need to re rewrite all the Python glue code and pre-processing and, and logic. Uh, and, and, and I think we still have a long way to go there too, right? Like TVM has this kind of tensor to tensor API and, and most of the other frameworks do as well. And so having one system that can kind of encompass both sides. Um, we're, I, I think WebAssembly might be part of, of the eventual answer to this is, okay, I've got my application code and it's general purpose code and I'm gonna leverage you know, WebAssembly and all the pipelines there to get that uh, integrated there. And then uh, for the machine learning workload piece, you know, compile that through a machine learning compiler and, and have them automatically still paired at the end. So you have one portable efficient uh, uh, piece that can be shipped around and, and is not um, overly uh, specific to any one system. Uh, I think we still have a long way to go there. I think the Rust community has a pretty good chance of being a possible you know, way of doing this because of their kind of uh, uh, where they are in, in WebAssembly capabilities and, and you have this kind of full compilation machinery uh, with some of the niceties of, of Python, Go might be another one. Um, or, you know, you might just, we've seen a little bit of embracing of Python with uh, what MicroPython on the new Raspberry Pi hardware and um, in, in this uh, server side, uh, uh, kind of shipping Python with your ML code and just injecting it and kind of uh, taking, that, taking that along for the ride. So I uh, also on the TVM side, we're, we're continually trying to expand what's possible to be shipped and, and optimized through TVM. So expanding to you know, FFT and uh, divide and conquer algorithm strategies. So you can, in the classical ML is another work. Sparsity is, is another one to, to handle uh, graph convolutional networks, et cetera. Uh, so I think, I think uh, some linear combination of, of those approaches is, uh, is, is likely going to play a, a part in the future. Yeah, that's super interesting. In particular, I'm actually curious if the work uh, that you mentioned from Microsoft and Bird on like um, trying to compile algorithms that were not like ideally, like originally thought of as targets for for TVM, maybe that, you know, maybe brought in some sparsity aspects and some other things that may be specifically useful also for data pre-processing, data post-processing. I'm not sure, maybe you have a better intuition. Yeah, I'd have to ask Tianchi or, uh, or maybe Jared on, on the original thoughts of TVM. I, I know that the project was, you know, originally on, around, okay, making these assumptions that we're just considering deep learning and, and dense linear algebra computations. Now that simplifies the product problem space and, and solution space. Um, but now we're, as we're learning the right representations and, and making the system more flexible and, and now TR is fully turning complete, et cetera. Uh, we're, we're taking those benefits and, and actually extending those. So now we can actually, as an example of this, um, we can now compile not only the operators, but, but also the full um, execution graph uh, using TR itself. So now instead of just a set of operators and then invoking those uh, infused operators, we can actually co-generate those and co-generate the driving code 
And so we're kind of moving up the abstraction space with what TVM is able to do. Uh, and then, yeah, other people have been taking this and like the DGL uh, uh, graph um, neural network community has, has taken TVM and expanded it to sparse matrix vector and, and sparse matrix matrix computations for these workloads. And, and yeah, it seems to be extending quite well, actually, uh, uh, with our kind of continual moving up this space. And, and we're still being conscious not to try and go and solve the, the general purpose uh, workload problem, because then we lose any advantages we have. Makes sense, makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much for the answer. Yeah, no, no problem. Great question. And Jason, I, want, I wanted to, to piggyback off of Piero mentioning kind of different bottlenecks in the ML pipeline. Um, because nowadays people are looking to train a lot of models, you know, distributed over a set of devices. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on, you know, what role compilers might have to play to help um, kind of remove some of the bottlenecks we see in distributed training. I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I forgot to address that part of Pierre's question. Um, well, or, or that tangential part is, uh, and actually Luis Seza's uh, lab, one of his students, uh, P-Link and P-Hub are two th things to search for. They have applied some of this kind of uh, automation paradigm on the, the distributed training side of things and sprinkling in kind of smart NICs and you know, computation at the, the, the fabric layer as well. Um, and I, I think, yes, you're exactly right. I, I think the, comp the compiler approach really uh, is, is almost needed at this space because it's, it, it again is this problem where you have you know, a, a pretty formalizable system of, of a set of hardware connected by certain um, you know, network topologies and fabrics and, and feeds and speeds. And then I have a, a computation or a set of computations that I wanna map to that. And it seems very natural to like make that a more, much more declarative system than it is today, as opposed to me having to go in and kind of uh, either uh, uh, taking a general abstract approach to the problem with, with kind of Ray uh, you know, or, or, or a parameter server and, and using um, kind of uh, very generic approaches that, that just kind of try to you know, plumb over the, the uh, topology specifically that you get from your AWS instances in the, in the server uh, region, or uh, do you actually em embrace it, right? And embrace the automation to you know, really uh, test the network bandwidth that you have available and kind of uh, derive the, a possible topology and then set up your, your devices um, and, and kind of gradient uh, reduction paths accordingly. And, and to me, yeah, it seems really ripe for, for the compilation approach. And some of the work's been done here, but I think it, uh, it's still, you know, really ripe area. Hey, Jason, I wanted to ask a, a couple of questions about kind of comparisons in terms of the workloads versus um, some other, uh, you know, languages for acceleration that you might see in other domains. Um, and then afterwards wanted to, you know, shout out to a couple audience questions. We've been uh, seeing a couple streaming on chat. So don't sure. worry, audience, we'll, we'll get those in. Um, so I'm a, I'm a little bit familiar with uh, the, uh, kind of the Halide language and their efforts to uh, build an auto scheduler in Halide. Mm. Um, and if I remember correctly from following that literature, um, my impression was that over on the Halide side, they were having a lot of trouble kind of like getting together a good auto scheduler that could kind of match uh, expert human performance. Um, so I was wondering if you had insight about um, maybe like the differences in types of workloads between, you know, uh, the, the typical like halide thing, which is, you know, usually very intense, like image um, mm. manipulation and image processing versus um, like maybe there's a difference in type of workload that makes it uh, kind of possible to, to do auto scheduling to, you know, such great effect in TVM or uh, any insights there. Yeah, great question. One of them is, uh, well, I, I should have mentioned this earlier. Um, TVM actually leveraged uh, Halide's uh, intermediate representation early on as, as an inspiration. I think even some of the direct code, uh, but since then we've, we've changed uh, quite a bit and iterated since then. Uh, so it's, it's uh, as in you know, most academic projects, there's, there's a great uh, reuse of, of thought uh, leadership there. Um, then uh, one of the actual improvements is, is Halide, uh, because of its computer vision focus has more of an assumption of uh, rectilinear, uh, and actually I think two-dimensional, I think that's been relaxed, but uh, tensors and, and operators. And so that's one of the, the constraints we've actually relaxed in TVM because 
to support um, a broader range of use cases in, in deep learning uh, than just computer vision. Um, on the auto scheduling itself, um, if if I remember, we have it, it's actually somewhat similar in that uh, the auto scheduler work in Halide came before the, the auto scheduler work I presented today, and, and you'll find in TVM today. And um, I think one is that we were able to learn from the great work and, and the Halide community, and and take some of those approaches and apply new approaches. And if I remember correctly, um, uh, the a lot of the abilities we've we we have in auto scheduling and TVM today are uh, it's it's a pretty complex system already of of uh, doing a joint optimization problem of you know you actually look at the full network um, not in the way I was describing earlier with the challenges but you you kind of have a computational budget that you divvy out to the the, the uh, number of iterations you give to each kernel that you're optimizing and you actually do some borrowing of strength across those like I mentioned the transfer learning. And so, and you uh, use uh, evolutionary strategies for for some of the combinations of uh, kernel um, sketches and importance of kernel sketches as you're exploring the space. And so, uh, I, I believe some of those are improvements over what we saw in the, the highlight auto scheduling work. Um, but I'm really not the right person to ask, so I, I shouldn't uh, you know go too far out of limb here. So I think it's it's mainly though that we were able to see that what that community did, and and then. Uh, really grow on top of that is, is the primary. Oh, and was there another Laying question your, uh, piece to that? I think I oh, cut. Uh, oh. No, I think. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah that, that, that was just a bit. Um, yeah, cool. Oh, it was good to hear about, you know, researchers like laying one more brick on top of the, That's right. uh, yeah. you know, the, the wall of knowledge. Um, I, there was a really interesting question from the audience um, that I think a lot of people kind of wonder about, you know, projects to go from academic projects to uh, uh, production. Um, so Alex Ko is asking, uh, since TVM is open source, um, what incentives do folks have to partner with OctoML, the company versus just, you know, download the, the, the open source code and, and use it themselves? Right, right. So, yeah, this is a, a common question. Uh, and uh, so there's, there's, there's two, two parts of that, uh, or, or more than that, but two main parts. Uh, the first is that we're happy to work with partners to extend TVM's uh, you know, capabilities and, and hardware backend support uh, for, for their workloads and, and use cases. So we're working with a number of um, notable partners on, on doing this today. Uh, so we, we do, uh, and we all of this work, uh, or almost all of it, we, we push upstream to help not only the partner we're working with, but ourselves and the rest of the community as well. So uh, definitely you know, haven't left the TVM community behind or, or anything like that. Then as far as our you know, software as a service platform is concerned, um, there's a lot of, uh, the way we see it today is, is there's a lot of uh, benefits and, and value add we're adding on top of TVM um, by hosting the service, running the hardware, um, doing the packaging work on top of what TVM does today, uh, you know, doing extra model analysis and, and validation of, of what you pass in that, than what TVM does. I mean, Fortunately, we're in a space um, unlike uh, you know other projects, which uh, I would say like Spark and, and uh, Ka uh, Kafka as, as examples of you know Databricks and Confluent, uh, according or respectively. Um, those are like services that you run and are kind of designed for end users, uh, developers. Whereas TVM is you know a much lower level compiler toolkit, and there's a lot of knobs to turn uh, and tune, and it's it's a pretty complex piece of software. So. There's a lot of benefit we add by the the SaaS layer on top, um, and so you know if if you if you have the knowledge and capabilities and time to go and you know build your own solution with TVM, then you know definitely we're you know happy to see that happen and hope you contribute back to the TVM community and we're happy to help you do that. Um, but otherwise, we think the vast majority of people uh, are served by the SaaS product we're we're building now, and then as we continue in the future, there's you know, additional capabilities and that we are, are planning on layering on top as well um, that are just going to keep uh, growing value there. So that's our current uh, thinking. But as always in a startup, um, you're always on your thinking on your feet as you as you're running. <laughs> uh, awesome. Yeah, I, I'll get like the uh, the other couple of questions that we had um, in the audience. Uh, Mark uh, was asking about any plans to migrate related to an ML IR dialect. And uh, Yang was asking about any plans for automatic operator fusion and relay. Um, so, great questions. Yeah, on the MLIR side, yes, the 
And actually the community is already working on a relay MLIR dialect so that we have interoperability um, at the roughly the HLO uh, level with, with MLIR. And so that makes, you know, improves the uh, capabilities for TVM to be back into TensorFlow, for instance, uh, more than just an importer for serialized models. Um, we're also considering the kind of lower level MLIR interrupt to affine dialect or, or the lower level dialects. And uh, that one, it's a little less clear kind of how that would look and what it would enable um, for, for both sides of the ecosystem. But um, I, I bet the community is uh, cooking up some interesting things as always there. And then on the second side, automatic fusion, um, we're starting to see this. Yeah, so as uh, kind of TIR, uh, the lower level continues to improve in, uh, in capabilities, Relay and, and the interaction with TIR, um, I think we're, we're working on a, a refactor of the compiler interface so that you can actually kind of in the Relay level before you go all the way to CodeGen, you can essentially expand into TIR, consider what the you know memory footprint and layouts are using that low-level knowledge, and then use that to make decisions at the Relay level. So um, we have started down this path and there's uh, PRs uh, in the TVM project for that. But not yeah. really for fusion specifically yet, but I, I think that's the necessary prerequisite for that. So hopefully uh, that addresses uh, you know most of the questions we had in the audience. I'm also curious quickly to get your take on uh, kind of the you know larger transition, uh, the larger arc in machine learning towards very large scale models, uh, the GD3 mm. and these styles of models, which are often uh, you know. Um, take very long to train. And then the inference is actually the main operation there because you were just doing inference maybe millions of times on the same model. So do you have thoughts on uh, you know, how that kind of workload that's emerging uh, might have impact on the work that you do? Yes, um, it's, it's a great question. I, I think we're, there's a couple of things that are interesting there. One is that while the expansion of model size on the training size tends to help just soak up all the data and make the you know, SGD kind of uh, pathway through the energy landscape more amenable for what techniques we have today. Um, it's not clear that we need all of those parameters for the, the final output and, and use case, right? Uh, and so there's, there's quite a lot of interesting work in the distillation space of taking those large transformers and uh, compressing them. I think also like switch transformers and a mixture of experts, like the sparsely gated capabilities are interesting because it's, it's, it's kind of acknowledging that, yeah, we really don't need all that primary space all the time. We can just turn on one little bit, bit at a time. And then potentially you have, you know, when you deploy, you could potentially page things in and out depending on kind of timing and domains of, of what your application is. Um, and all of these kind of things point to needing more flexibility and capabilities with your deployment and, and optimization pipeline. So I, I'm pretty excited to see what the transformer community develops. I, you know, some people say, well, wait a second, aren't transformers going to take over and, and those are going to be so optimized and what are you going to do as a compiler? And it's like, no, 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 no. It's like, that's like saying in the, you know, 1987, like, oh yeah, everything's going to be a database, right? And, and you just need one database to run all computation and, and or one OS and one database. And I think we've seen the result of that. And I think we'll see the same thing with machine learning. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great, <laughs> great analogy. I really like that. Um, yeah, I think we're almost at the end of time. So uh, I really want to thank you for, for the great talk and, and answering all, all of our questions um, and all the audience questions as well. Uh, thanks as well to our audience for tuning in. Um, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, do so please and please go to our website, mlsys.stanford.edu um, and also you know, add our mailing list. We uh, send out weekly reminders for the talks that we uh, post. And I think next week is Dan, you can remind me who it is. I always- uh, uh, Next always week, forget. that's a great question. As I pull it up, uh, <laughs> this is me stalling. Well, and while you're stalling, th you thanks just... so much for having me. This was uh, really a blast, and I hope it was useful for everyone. No, definitely, yeah. We, we enjoy it. it was definitely a change from, uh, you know, we haven't had a compiler talk yet, so it was a... Uh, oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Last thing I want to be is the third compiler talk in a row. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. um, next week, we've got Aaron Liddell with a scalable machine learning with H2O. So that sounds really fun. Nice. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, see you. Bye. -bye.